veggie libel laws. I mean, they clearly violate the First Amendment. But, um, you know, the, the industry is, uh, I mean, they're really tough. And there's now a PR campaign that's been organized by Big Ag, and it's fronted by the farm lobby, and they have $30 million, and they're going after people like this. They're going after critics of the, of the food industry. I've had many, um, not many, but I've had a, a half dozen or so appearances at college campuses um, either uh, canceled or changed or um, uh, boycotted by organized efforts by the industry. So they are really tough, um, but uh, I, I just don't think we can let this uh, get in our way. Um, I'm, I'm actually more worried about the politicians than I am the food industry. Here in San Francisco, not too long ago, we passed the toy ban. Now who here thought the toy ban was a good idea or not? Anybody think it was a good idea? You should tell them what it is. So the toy ban basically said, you can't put the toy in with the Happy Meal. If the parents want to buy the toy separately, let them buy the toy separately. No extra coercion is necessary for a kid to eat a Happy Meal. That was the idea. Okay? You didn't, it didn't remove the toy, it just made the toy not part of the meal. Okay? So I, I thought it was a very good idea and I actually wrote an op-ed for the Chronicle on it along with uh, um, uh, the Corporate Accountability International. Well, guess what? Fifteen states now have bans against toy bans. <laughs> They're the people I'm worried about. Over here. I'm Maxine Barish. I'm a, an internist in Sacramento and I'm a fellow with the Arizona program. Um, Dr. Weil, you talk about physicians um, organizing and you know, we should be um, really more, have, have a more active voice. What I see is sort of cynical is that um, uh, medicine is an industry and so many of my colleagues who are specialists really are not interested in changing things in public health because it's gonna put them out of jobs. So I guess my question to you is, do you see any hope for the medical industry, uh, the medical profession as it stands, um, because those of us in primary well, care that's are a, really- Well, that's an especially cynical view of medicine. I mean, there was, I quote- But very appropriate. But very appropriate. In, in, uh, but do your colleagues actually put it that way? <laughs> well, in, in uh, Health and Healing, I quoted a, I think it was a commencement speaker at Stanford who said that if, uh, if, uh, Doctors were as uh, if, if if words if we to judge by words rather than actions. Doctors uh, to judge by actions rather than words. Doctors are as much interested in health as soldiers are in peace. So that's that's this very cynical view of medicine. Uh, my sense is that most physicians really are interested in health and in helping people, and I think part of helping people is to get information of this sort to people in ways that they can understand. I think, you know, if, if you can present information to people in ways that they can understand and connect with their own experience, I think they'll act on it. And I think this information, for example, that drinking a glass of orange juice is not that different from drinking a glass of soda, and that's very interesting information. I think if people could understand, you know, there's this idea that fruit juice is inherently healthy. Uh, if, if we could change that, I think we could change behavior. And I think if we could act together uh, as a community of enlightened health professionals, we could begin to exert influence uh, in the culture because that's where the change has to happen. Uh, the, the reason that they're now, it's not the politicians that, I mean the politicians act this way because they're in the pockets of the people who are making out from the system as it is now. And again, that only will change to a change in consciousness in the general culture, and I think we can be instrumental in making that happen. I'm a cynic too, by the way. I just want to make that very clear. You know, if, if, if fruit juice was so good for you, then the citrus growers wouldn't have had to hire Anita Bryant. Think of it that way. In addition, the dentists are just as bad as the doctors, because if all of a sudden cavities went away, where would their livelihood be? And the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry took $1 million from Coke about four years ago. And one of my uh, colleagues who's a cardiologist is talking about how many years he has left to make a lot of money to put his kids through school. That's his goal, is to get his kids through college so he can pay for that because he knows that the crash is coming and that 
either there's going to be no money or we're finally going to get it and prevention will be key and then well, he'll be out of a job. No well, look, I mean, look, <laughs> there's, there, there, is, there are all sorts of reasons to go into any given profession, okay? My brother-in-law works for Smith Barney, okay? All he cares about is money. Presumably doctors go into medicine because they care about something else. But you know what? Not everybody's that. Uh, you guys you are know. scaring the general public. But here. it's not. <laughs> but it's not about individuals. I mean, it really is not about individuals. It's about institutions. And 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 your general point is right. I mean, we have a, a healthcare industry that benefits greatly from the diseases caused by the right. American food industry. Right. Well, we have and a sick. We have a sickness paradigm, not a wellness paradigm. Andy has said it many times in this conference. And we need to change the set of incentives. We need to do more like Preston Maring was here earlier, many of you heard him, talking about what they do at Kaiser. And Kaiser happens to be set up in such a way that they make more money uh, the healthier their population is. And so, gee, they care about food. They have farmer's markets in their parking lots. Certain steps will follow if you change the structure. but. You know, all of that may seem kind of like, wow, that's a long way away till we get to that kind of system. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that this movement I is happening now. And that you see it every time you go to a farmer's market. And you see it, um, you know, all around us now. You see it even when you go to the Safeway and you see organic as a mainstream food choice, a $24 billion industry. So there, there are many big political challenges that are going to be really difficult and are going to take a generation to address. But in the meantime, there are people like you and, um, and many of your neighbors that are building an alternative food system now. And that's politics too. Um, that's voting with your fork. That's you know, not giving your money to, to multinational food companies, but building an alternative economy. And that's very alive and well, even in this lousy economy. I and mean, in fact, it's a miracle that the food movement wasn't killed off in 2008, uh, that organic is still growing, that, that farmers markets are still growing. People want an alternative. They can't even express exactly why. Um, and that as health professionals, you guys are thought leaders in your communities. You have the ear of people on this issue of their health. And that integrative medicine is growing the way it is. Look at it and look right. at the numbers of people coming to this conference. So, you know, yeah. all that's happening. Right. So there's a lot of things that make me very hopeful. So just, ju just remember, there's three food movements out there right now. Okay, there's the slow food movement of Alice Waters, food for food's sake, the aesthetic properties of food. Okay, and Andy's part of that as well. We have the socio-political aspect of food, which Michael is, you know, leading al along with Andy as well. And then there's the biochemical aspect of food, which I'm at least part of. I mean, to be honest with you, all, of, all physicians are part of. And we're all ultimately saying the same thing. And it's because these three food movements are basically saying the same thing and are so aligned that we are able to do just that. We have about uh, 10 minutes left, so I'm going to ask you guys to ask brief questions, and we'll try to get through them all before we end. So, I'm a health and nutrition coach in training, and my question is, is there a paradigm shift happening in the medical community among doctors in the United States toward using food as medicine? Well, I, that is certainly central to integrative medicine <coughs> philosophy. It is central to the trainings that we provide at the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. So to the extent that this is becoming a mainstream phenomenon, I would say yes. You know, we still represent a, a very small percentage of the medical profession What and percentage would that be? I, I can't guess. It's tiny. But it's influential. You can't pick up any medical journal today without seeing reference to integrative medicine. Uh, integrative medicine is a accept, totally accepted term in medical discourse. Um, all, all, all a third of the nation's medical schools have joined the academic consortium, consortium of academic health centers for integrative medicine. So it is becoming a mainstream movement. Having said that, nutrition uh, education in medical schools totally sucks. Right. <laughs> Over here. Hi, I'm Annie Lees. I'm a holistic health coach from Maine. And my question is for Michael. Um, how do you feel about the Monsanto movement with alfalfa? I don't really understand exactly what's going on there. I figure you might be able to shed some light. 
uh, the Obama administration um, recently uh, deregulated alfalfa, permitted genetically modified alfalfa. Uh, it's engineered with a, a gene to resist the, the herbicide Roundup. Um, I think it was a tremendous mistake. It's a real threat to organic agriculture, which depends on alfalfa to feed animals in, in animal agriculture. And they're required to use organic feed, and that feed stands a very good chance of becoming contaminated. Um, I think it's one of the stupider products um, because, you know, as things stand now, 90 some odd percent of alfalfa, 93 percent of alfalfa farmers don't use any herbicide at all. So it's an unnecessary product to take these risks with. And not only that, the Roundup is obsolete as an herbicide. We've sprayed so much of it over the last few years that it's not working anymore. So you have an obsolete, unnecessary product being introduced that jeopardizes organic agriculture. I think it was a tremendous mistake. It needs to be said that uh, Secretary Vilsack, the USDA, USDA secretary, was trying to engineer a compromise between the organic industry and the, um, uh, and the GM industry and, and coming up with a coexistence plan, which actually, you know, it wasn't going to be great, but it was a very important precedent that there was an obligation to protect organic agriculture and that you needed buffer zones and it would have m vastly complicated the life of all genetically modified farmers. Uh, and he was overwhelmed, uh, overruled by the White House. And I found that very alarming. And the, the, the scientists around Obama are very pro-GM. Um, you know, we all wanted a president who actually listened to science after George Bush, who didn't. Well, there's science and there's science. There are physicists and there are biologists, for example. And he listens to physicists, um, Stephen Chu and people like that. And they love GM. And he's, uh, unfortunately, he's not listening to biologists or ecologists. Um, so I, I think they're going to go further, actually, from the White House on this. I think they're eager to completely deregulate GM, which is, I find very alarming. Scary. That's very scary. So it's, uh, we're getting close to close. I would say we're going to take two more questions, and then that's it, because it is a school night. So over here. <laughs> My name is Ruth Gingrich. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner from Carmel. And in our area, doctors have gotten quite excited about Lavaza, which is a food nutrient, omega-3s, which has been changed slightly so that it's now pharmaceutical. And, I, and I've read that there's some other nutrients that are maybe going along that line. A friend of mine was on it for a couple of months. The insurance paid. Now it's not. It's $400 a bottle for her or $400 a month for omega-3s. Well, the Lovaza is a, pres is a prescription form of esterified omega-3 fatty acids uh, from fish. It's a very good product. Uh, there are equivalently good products that are non-prescription forms. The advantage of Lovaza was that it would be paid for by insurance. Uh, it's only got one FDA indication, which is to lower high serum triglycerides. So if you want to take omega-3s for depression, for example, or for bipolar disorder, or for other things, insurance won't cover it. But I think it's a perfectly good product. Last question. Hi, I'm Malia Meek from Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm a PA in internal medicine. And uh, speaking again to the toxic qualities of um, fructose corn syrup, um, I'm actually more interested in the um, artificial sweeteners and their toxic qualities. Actually more of my patients, because I see a lot of diabetics, and of course they're now scared of sugars, and they're, they're moving to, for more you know, example, without using any labels, but Splenda and now Truvia. And um, with that, I don't know how much data is out there right now on it, but I'm wondering what the side effects are for my patients with that. I wish I knew. Yeah. Um, it, the, the, uh, the short answer is there's something called pharmacokinetics and there's something called pharmacodynamics. Pharmacokinetics is what your body does to a drug. Pharmacodynamics is what a drug does to your body. Okay? They're not the same. We have all of the pharmacokinetics on every non-nutritive sweetener that's on the market because the FDA demands those studies. You can't get through the FDA without those studies. Okay. So we have all the PK that you can imagine. We have absolutely no pharmacodynamics, period, none, zilcho, nada. And the reason is because there's no point for the food industry, you know, or the, you know whatever company makes that non-nutritive sweetener, to do them because it can only hurt their sales and that they're not necessary in order to get them onto the market. 
So the short answer is, I can't tell you. I don't know. There is no data. And as long as there's no data, I can't comment on it, because I'm about the science. Gotcha. So should we have that data? Should they do those studies? Absolutely. Question is, who should do them? The NIH? The NIH says the food industry should do them. The food industry says, why should we? So right now we're at an impasse. But there is starting to be some pressure to be born on this. And so give it about five, six, seven years, and we may start seeing some. Are you recommending artificial sweeteners to your patients? Of course not. Okay. You know, Just wanted to be on the same page. Yeah, and there's, I said this to the conference yesterday. I'll say it again quickly. There's a, I see a great danger in the use of non-nutritive sweeteners, which is rarely discussed. And that is that if the brain gets a, gets a message that sweet calories are coming and then they don't, I think this sets up patterns of craving that get you into much worse relationships with food. And, this is, and also clinically what I see is there's no evidence at all that, that non-nutritive sweeteners help people lose weight, which is why most people use them. And I see a lot of people with really bad eating habits who drink immense quantities of beverages sweetened with non-nutritive sweeteners. So in closing, I'm going to ask each of you, um, the members of the public here and for the health professionals, what one thing would you say they should go home with and share with their friends and family and say, this is something you really should be thinking about? Eat real food. I, I, I second that. And a calorie is not a calorie. And watch out for that orange juice. <laughs> well, on that note, please help me thank the panelists. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful evening.